Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me uh, to First Chronicles chapter 29. I invite you to take that up, First Chronicles 29. I do want to extend just a public thank you um, to, to a few people. Uh, our elders, Dan Burnett, who's just up here, and Mike McCullough as well, and several staff members have, uh, have been working tirelessly to launch this 2020 Vision Giving Initiative. Uh, they've been working very, very hard, and we're excited about what is in store here at FAC in the coming years, and we're excited for you to be a part of it as well. And so what I want to do this morning is take a look at First Chronicles 29 in light of launching this uh, 2020 vision. Uh, we want to look at this passage and see what does God have to say about my giving? What does God have to say uh, about my own money? And so I'm going to read uh, just through the first 17 verses in chapter 29. Um, the, up on the screen, you'll actually see the first 19 verses, but I changed my mind. We're going to stop at verse 17. Um, it's a little bit lengthy, so go ahead and bear with me. Follow along with me as I read, uh, and then we'll begin. First Chronicles 29, verse 1. And David, the king, said to all the assembly, Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced, and the work is great, for the palace will not be for man, but for the Lord God. So I have provided for the house of my God so far as I was able, the gold for the things of gold, and the silver for the things of silver, and the bronze for the things of bronze, the iron for the things of iron, and wood for the things of wood, besides great quantities of onyx and stones for setting antimony, colored stones, all sorts of precious stones and marble. Moreover, in addition to all that I have provided for the holy house, I have a treasure of my own of gold and silver. And because of my devotion to the house of my God, I give it to the house of my God. 3,000 talents of gold of the gold of Ophir and 7,000 talents of refined silver for overlaying the walls of the house and for all the work to be done by craftsmen, gold for the things of gold and silver silver for the things of silver who then will offer willingly consecrating himself today to the lord then the leaders of fathers houses made their free will offerings as did also the leaders of the tribes the commanders of thousands and of hundreds and the officers over the king's work they gave for their service of the house of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. And whoever had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord in the care of Jehiel the Gershonite. Then the people rejoiced because they had given willingly, for with a whole heart they had offered freely to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. Therefore, David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own have we given you. For we are strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on earth are like a shadow and there is no abiding. O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things. And now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we now look to your word, I pray that you would give us an open and a whole and a pure heart. I ask, Father, that we would examine um, ourselves and that you would convict us where we need convicted. You would teach us what we don't know, and you would open our eyes, Father, to what you would have for us to see this morning. And in your holy name I pray. Amen. 118 years ago this month, 
two men by the name of Mark uh, George Buchanan and Vincent Brush met in a home in Harbor Creek. Uh, where they decided to join the Alliance Movement. The Alliance Movement, it was an evangelistic movement that began in the country about 13 years prior by a Presbyterian minister by the name of A.B. Simpson. As the men spoke, Buchanan and Brush had a vision to see Erie transformed by Christ. Over the course of the next 14 years, they would hold regular prayer meetings and gatherings in homes where they would pray and study God's word. And they met in churches, uh, various churches, and they would be committed to the mission's work of Jesus with that being their emphasis. And the public would actually recognize this group of people simply as the mission. Then on June 2nd, 1913, a charter was drawn uh, incorporating the Alliance work under the name of the Gospel Tabernacle of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And by March of the following year, an official congregation was gathered for the first time with 33 charter members. 33 members sat at 124 West 18th Street in 1913 and had a vision to see Erie transformed by Christ. Through the major and intentional outreach of the gospel tabernacle, hundreds of people in Erie came to know Christ in 1922 and joined the church. And due to the rapid growth, the rapid gospel-induced growth, new provisions were needed to be made. So an offering was taken up, and a large duplex home was was purchased on West 11th Street for $20,000. Now, this building was remodeled, and the congregation moved into its new home on October 2nd, 1923. Hundreds of members sat at 145 West 11th Street in 1923 and had a vision to see Erie transformed by Christ. The church uh, would enjoy more than 50 years of fruitful ministry at the 11th Street location, and it was during their time here that on October 6, 1965, the uh, name of the church was officially changed to First Alliance Church. The congregation's mission didn't stop there, though. They saw an opportunity on the horizon, an opportunity that would be risky, That would require sacrifice and willingness. They were led by God to purchase a 33-acre farmland property out in the middle of nowhere, outside city limits, located at 2939 Zimmerly Road. There were congregants who mortgaged their own homes in order to build the very facility that we occupy today. There were congregants who literally laid bricks of this building themselves. Such men and women had a vision to see Erie transformed by Christ. We stand on the shoulders of men and women who have selflessly and willingly gave so much of themselves so that you and I may know and learn of the sweet love of Jesus. And so while the people have changed and the programs have changed and the building has changed, the mission is still the same. If you were to go back and look at the yearbook and directory of the Gospel Tabernacle in 1930 and 31, this is what it says. Our aim is evangelism. We want to reach the masses. To this end, we are looking forward to the time when we can complete the remodeling of the church. So even 90 years ago, the pure motivation behind building improvements was that of evangelism. And FAC has done a lot of it. Since its inception, FAC has sent out over 100 full-time workers into the ministry at home and abroad. Foreign missions movements have been born. Citywide ministries have started. Churches committed to reaching the world for Christ have been planted. All because of the men and women, not much different than yourselves, 
who were willing to sacrifice and demonstrate their true devotion to God and his work. And now we sit today on the cusp of a new chapter. It's a new day for FAC and the future is bright. But with all the things that we have going on and all the things that fill our schedules and all the things on our to-do list and all the programs that we run, I hope that in a hundred years from now, one thing remains the same. I hope they remember one thing about FAC in 2019. I hope that our people in 100 years will look back and say that in February of 2019, several hundred members sat at 2939 Zimmerly Road and they had a vision to see Erie transformed by Christ. We are not a social club. We are not a gathering of people that come and enjoy our time together only to separate in the afternoon and wait until next week. We we are not those things. No, according to scripture, we are a battalion in a spiritual war, my friends. And we need to advance the gospel. That is our call. Thousands of years ago, David, the king of Israel, had a vision. His vision was to build a great temple for God that would serve as a permanent residence of the Ark of the Covenant. You see, to the Israelites, the Ark was a physical representation of the very presence of God. One commentator wrote that uh, they saw the importance of the presence of God and they saw the temple as the embodiment of that promise. Their hearts burned with zeal to build a house worthy of his presence. See, in order to build a house worthy of his presence, it was David's desire that this temple would be magnificently extravagant as to give God the glory that he deserves. So the grandeur of the temple was a mark of the grandeur of God's own glory. And so David saw this over-the-top, beautiful temple as a representation of the riches that God himself provides. In order for this to happen, though, David understands that it would take a group effort to fund the project. This is not a one-man uh, show. What I read earlier is the recollection of a giving initiative put in place by David to build the temple. And I think there are a number of themes that we can draw out of the text, out of this passage that should mark our own involvement in, the, uh, in FAC's 2020 vision. There are characteristics that should shape not only how we give to this project per se, but how uh, our very framework for how we view giving in general. And so I want to walk through this passage together with you with the rest of our time this morning. Um, The first thing that we see in this passage comes in verse one. It's a purpose. Verse one is a purpose. We find the purpose and motivation for building the temple in the first place. The backdrop of this passage is actually one of transition. David is handing his crown down to his son, Solomon. David recognizes that they are in a time of transition, and he reminds his people of the important things when they are in transition. He's saying, look, my son Solomon, he's getting the crown. He's young. He's inexperienced. The guy doesn't know what he's doing, right? He's a fool. (laughs) But let me remind you, What's important? Let me remind you what we're doing. See, this temple that we're building, it's not for me. It's not for my son. It's not for you. This is for God. This is for God. It isn't to satisfy their own cravings and selfish desires. It isn't to show themselves off, essentially, to the kids on the block. No, this is to show off God's glory, As we launch our 2020 giving initiative, as we look to retire the mortgage, as we look to make these building improvements, we must realize that this is not for our own gain. This is not for our satisfaction. This is not for our desire. This isn't to reach out to the community and say, hey, look at us. Look what we did. Look what we can do. Absolutely not. We are wasting our time if this is for our own satisfaction. 
our giving is in vain if our motivation is impure. And so we all have to look at this initiative through the lens that there is ministry to be done and a glorious, magnificent God to glorify through it. While we are giving towards our debt and hoping to improve on the building, our emphasis is not on the building in and of itself, but the transformed lives that are going to walk through these doors as a result transformed lives that are not only going to walk into these doors, but they're also going to walk out of these doors and they're going to go out into the world and they're going to brush shoulders with other people and they're going to have an impact on other people. There's going to be a ripple effect. You see, as, as people are transformed through this project, it's going to have a ripple effect as they impact others. We aren't, just investing in our own body. We're investing in the lost. We're investing in the world. This is a long-term investment and the return will come when there are souls and the souls of others that are impacted for eternity. Folks, we are not building a temple. We're building a kingdom. God has so graciously invited us to be a part of building his kingdom. The purpose, we have to start there. David recognizes the purpose. He knows what the purpose is. And then he knows, as any true leader knows, that he needs to lead by example. As verses two through four, we have a purpose in verse one, an example in verse two through four. And this example is marked by two characteristics, trust and devotion. Trust and devotion. He describes in verse two, all the different building materials that he's given, They're giving the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, the wood, the precious stones that he's giving towards the building fund. But these building materials mentioned in verse two are actually probably just from Israel's treasury. These would have been spoils of war. These would have been former spoils from just earlier conquests that Israel as a country, as a nation has, um, has stored up. But then we see something significant in verse three. David ponies up in verse three. What does he say? Moreover, in addition to all that I have provided for the holy house, I have a treasure of my own of gold and silver. And because of my devotion to the house of my God, I give it. This treasure that he gives in verse three is different than the treasure that he gives in verse two. This would have been very extremely valuable personal property for David from his own personal stash. This was important because this served as a reserve or an insurance, so to speak, for unforeseen hardships or natural disasters. In a sense, David is now giving money out of his own rainy day fund. David is giving money out of his savings account. David is giving money out of his retirement plan. He's very selfless in giving this because he's sacrificing his own personal security to God. See, we learn that our giving or lack thereof is naturally an issue of trust. And I get why it's so hard sometimes to give because we're not just giving our money, we're giving away our security. And this becomes an emotional experience. This is very emotional. This is why we don't talk about money very much because you don't know me and I don't know you and you don't know my experiences and I don't know yours. And you could be sitting here very emotional right now saying you don't understand the hole that I'm in. You don't get it. You don't understand the mess that I'm in. And you're right. I don't know. But I can speak to personal experience. My wife, Sarah, and I have experienced the financial hole. We know what it's like to have personally faced the strong temptation not to give. I know what it's like to look at my bank account and feel the need to take matters into my own hands. On one occasion, particularly, we fell into some financial distress due to some unfortunate uh, events out of our control. 
And I was ready to take matters into my own hands because I didn't feel like God was listening. I looked at God and said, don't you see, Lord, what you're putting me through right now? Don't you see how hard this is for my wife and for my children? Where are you right now? I didn't feel like he was listening. But in the conviction of my own heart, I heard God whisper, would you just trust me? Would you trust me? It was almost as if he was waiting for me to surrender it before he did anything. Trust me with your finances. So after duking it out with God for about two weeks, I surrendered. I surrendered the situation over to him. And wouldn't you know that over the course of the next two months, I would see God's hand at work. There was a series of unrelated and unprompted events where he provided literally 10 times what I needed to get out of our hole. It was almost as if God was saying to me personally, don't you see Mike? Don't you see that I understand your situation? Don't you see that you can trust me? Don't you see that you are my child and I love you and I value you and I'm going to take care of you? If you are in Christ, if you are a follower of Jesus, you have it by, by, by God's, the authority of God's word, you have a right to be called a child of God. And you reap all of the benefits that go along with being his son or being his daughter. And Jesus himself tells us to look to the sky. Look at the birds in the air. They're taken care of. Don't you think that God who loves you and values you like a child, if he's going to take care of those birds, that you're going to be provided for. And then Jesus says, look at the fields and and how richly the flowers are adorned. Don't you think, don't you think and believe that, that just as God cares for these flowers and dresses, these flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow, don't you think that he is going to provide for you, that he's going to bless you, that he's going to take care of you? You can try and fabricate your own security all you want by not allowing God to be the Lord of your wallet. But understand that true security, true safety cannot be found in anything we can attain in this world. It can only be found in the arms of our loving father. So perhaps as you sit here, And as you duke it out with God yourself, maybe just maybe he is whispering into your heart, would you just trust me? Would you just trust me? David demonstrates trust in his giving. Why? Because he has a devotion for God. David looks at his giving as a tangible way to demonstrate his devotion to God. From what we know about David, and we know a lot, his entire life was one of devotion to God. And here in our passage, he is literally putting his money where his mouth is. Or should I say he's putting his money where his devotion is. The measure of your devotion is determined by what it costs you. The measure of your devotion is determined by what it costs you. If nothing is at stake, is that true devotion? Are you really devoted to something if it doesn't cost you anything? Are you really devoted to something if you aren't even willing to give up something else for it? David demonstrates trust. He demonstrates devotion. And then he calls on his people in verse five, who then will offer willingly. I love this, this call. Who then will offer willingly? I love this call to action because David goes before them uh, as a servant leader, offering himself up first and then asks, who's with me? Who's with me? It's not a command. There's no obligation. It's just an open invitation. And then we see the response. Verses six through nine, we see a remarkable response. The quantities given are just enormous. 
And just as David's example was marked by a couple of characteristics of trust and devotion, the response of the people is marked by two characteristics as well. Unity and free will. Unity and free will. The tribal leaders, the political leaders, the military leaders are all of a single mindset in responding to the king's challenge. There is a great sense of unity among the people as they give. They know that they're in this together. They are protecting and participating as a family. Their response is marked by unity. And it says that they made free will offerings. The people gave freely. They gave according to their heart, just as there was no obligation on David's call to action. They didn't give out of obligation. His giving that wasn't required, but prompted by a willing heart. This is crucial to understand this idea of a free will offering, because this is actually the very framework, the very foundation that our faith is based on a free will offering. Jesus offered himself up willingly and sacrificially. He, he gave up his own life freely so that you could have life. In John chapter 10, Jesus is very adamant to say, look, you don't take my life. I lay it down on my own accord. You have no authority to take my life. I'm going to give it. I'm going to lay it down on my own accord, a free will offering. He did it freely and willingly with a pure heart. And so when we give of ourselves and we give our money freely without obligation, it is merely a small representation of what Christ did for us. This, this is a symbol. When we give, it is a symbol of what Christ did on the cross. Churches can use uh, just abuse and misuse scripture in regards to this. Um, in, in today's context, to the 21st century believer, there is absolutely no command in the Bible to give to the church. It might come as a surprise to you. You can search scripture all day long and you will never find a command for the believer in our context to, to, to give. If there was, I would leverage that, but I can't because there's not. <laughs> There are passages that mention the Israelites and uh, the command for them to give. But once again, in our context, there is no command. In fact, scripture says quite the opposite in the New Testament. If you were to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, this is what verse 6 through 8 says. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart not reluctantly or under compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. This passage shows that there's no obligation. There's no compulsion to give, but you are missing out on something when you don't. We are encouraged that the reward far outweighs the, any kind of cost. You see, we don't want something from you as a church leadership. We want something for you. We understand that this is an investment. And we believe that in the discipline of giving uh, and trusting God with your money, you will reap marvelous rewards unseen. And I can't tell you what that is going to look like specifically for you in your context. I can't tell you that you will receive that back monetarily, but I can tell you that you will have a reward and it will be fantastic and it will far outweigh the cost of giving. An immediate return of investment for the Israelites in our passage was joy. In verse nine, it says that the people rejoiced because of the generosity displayed. Because there's true joy when a, people, a group of people can come together in unity and freely give selflessly. When you see a team work together, there is joy. When you see a family come together and knock out an obstacle and everybody's on the same page despite their differences, there's joy. They rejoiced. 
And this rejoicing and great joy prompts David in verses 10 through 17 to pray to God. He gives thanks and praise. And he recognizes that God is the author of their wealth and that all things belong to him. You see, there was no need to impress God with their giving because it was already his. God doesn't need your money. There's no point in giving to either FAC or other nonprofits or the 2020 vision to try and impress God. He'll probably look at you and say, that's cute. That's, that's, that's nice, right? At the end of the day, God is the source and we're merely giving back to him what he has entrusted to us for a short time. But when we hold on to it, and we feel uh, that we need to keep it for ourselves, and when we feel entitled to it is when our hearts gravitate away from God and cling to our money. And so I'm going to ask you a question. Who is the Lord of your heart? What is the Lord of your heart? Is it God or is it your wallet? This is why verse 17 is so key and can really serve as an application verse for us this morning. Take a look at it. It's on the screen. David prays, I know my God that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness and the uprightness of my heart. I have freely offered all these things. And now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. Verse 17 is stating essentially that a pure heart leads to generous giving resulting in pure joy. God doesn't want your heart or wants your stuff. He wants your heart. God's never looked at your stuff. He's never looked at your appearance. He's always looked at the heart. He doesn't want your money. It already belongs to him. He doesn't want your wallet. He wants your heart. Your giving habits are forever linked to your heart. And because my giving is forever linked with my heart, my giving becomes a spiritual discipline of aligning my heart with his. And so while it's not commanded, it is encouraged and it is a demonstration of where your heart is. It's a demonstration of a pure heart. A pure heart prompts generous giving that leads to pure joy. As you think about your own giving habits toward the 2020 vision or just to the general fund, I don't want you to evaluate the condition of your finances. I want you to evaluate the condition of your heart. You don't have to give a dime and I would never know but it's God who sees your heart. And so however much you choose to give, or if you choose not to give at all, let me encourage you on one thing. Whatever you come to decide, be able to stand there in clear conscience and say, I have a pure heart in the matter. This is where my heart is. Do I have a pure heart? Because that is what God is looking at. And the one who gives a single dollar from a pure and trusting heart is a more pleasing offering to God than the one who gives thousands begrudgingly. Who or what is Lord of your heart? What is your vision set on? In a moment, I'm going to pray. And after I pray, we're going to take our normal Sunday offering um, just just for this week. And we don't want you to make any pledges today. I want you to hold on to those pledge cards that you were given earlier. I want you to take them home and put them somewhere where you're going to see them daily. On your fridge, on your desk, by your mirror. And every time you see it, I want you to say just a simple prayer. Lord, where is my heart? Where is my heart on the matter? I want you to evaluate the condition of your heart. And then, and only then, after you've prayed about it intentionally, after you've discussed it with your family, after you have evaluated the condition of your heart, can you fill out that pledge card and bring it back? We 
want 100% participation. Our goal in this initiative is 100% participation. We want everybody who feels connected to FAC in some way or another to participate. And I am well aware that there are people here today that don't feel like they can give much. But let me tell you, your gifts, so the one who says, I can only give this much, are very, very important. They, they, they are so important. And, and yours are the ones that will definitely come from a pure heart because you're not giving out of excess, but out of need. And that demonstrates true trust and true sacrificial devotion to God. Every last penny matters. Every last penny is an investment. Every last penny is building the kingdom of God. You have a role to play. Your gifts have an impact, no matter how large or small. And so let's come together willingly as a church family in unity and knock this thing out. And then we'll come back on April 7th, which we've identified as pledge day. And we will collect pledges and we will will amass the pledges that have already been handed in. And we will rejoice like the Israelites because we have been, because we have given willingly and we have given with a whole heart. Let's pray. Dear heavenly father, this is such a hard message and a hard passage to get up here and teach because I know my own heart, Lord. And I know I have given and offered so much to you, but so many times my wallet is the last thing I want to give. And so I ask Lord that you would work in my own heart, that you would work in the heart of the people, our people, our family, I ask, Father, that you would use this to build your kingdom. I thank you for our people and the ways that you've blessed them. And I ask, Father, that you bless this offering now as we take it up. That Jesus' name would be glorified and elevated because of it. And in your holy name I pray. Amen.